Hey, y'all. My name is Jay Westbrook. I'm an alcoholic. Sober today by God's mercy and the practice of the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, it's my first sobriety. I'm sober since December 2nd, 1988, and very grateful for that. Stephen, thank you so much for asking me, for asking me to come and speak. I know you thought you were going to get me alone, but actually there are a couple of us that are going to speak tonight. So I'll introduce a second, uh, my better half, Nancy. This is Nancy, because I'm going to talk a little bit about her. So you want a picture in your mind of what Nancy looks like. There's another absolutely beautiful, kinder than she was beautiful. And um, and I want to tell you a love story, you know, and it could I could go in any direction because I'm in love with Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm in love with the steps. I'm in love with the traditions. I'm in love with God. I'm in love with my life. I'm in love with my in with my wife and um, I'm in love with my career. And I could talk about any of those. And it would all be a love story. So um, what I'll tell you, it's kind of like in The Godfather, the greatest gangster movie ever made. And um, one of the, the, one of the greatest gangster movies ever made, one of the greatest movies ever made, and in it, Michael, the young son of the head gangster, um, who's not going to go into the business decides to avenge the attempt on his dad's life. And he kills the gangster that tried to kill his dad and the crooked cop protecting him. And he flees to Sicily and he's out walking and he sees Apollonia and it is amore prima vista, love at first sight. And they're inseparable from then on right up until her death, which sadly was not very long after they met. And, uh, and wed. And that's my story, exactly, except for the gangster part and, and the Sicily part. But other than that, it's my story. So it was, I'm old. Um, I'm really old. So it was Friday night, June 7th, 1968. There was a party in Pacific Palisades, California. I didn't want to go, but I knew there'd be good outside issues. So I went. And about one in the morning, my friend George came up with some little blonde and said, Nancy, this is Jay. Jay, this is Nancy. She wants to walk on the beach, not safe at night, even in the Palisades, go with her. And we took the footbridge over Pacific Coast Highway and came down on the beach and walked the beach and just walked and talked for five hours, maybe made out a little bit, but basically walked and talked and the sun came up and it was amore prima noche, love at first night. And we were truly inseparable from that first morning on. And we were both alcoholics and we were both drug addicts and we did it till the wheels fell off and mine fell off first on December 2nd, 1988. And uh, Nancy had no interest in getting sober, broke my heart. And, uh, but she got lonely, yay. And so she started going to meetings just for the, uh, what do you call it, entertainment value. And on my 90th day, Nancy stood up and uh, said, I'm Nancy Morgan Westbrook. I'm a cocaine addict and an alcoholic and stayed sober from then on. And um, 11 weeks to the day after our 42nd wedding anniversary, Nancy died in my arms in our home on hospice with pancreatic cancer. And the ground went out from under me and I didn't know if I could stay sober. But I got real clear that I was unwilling to disrespect the program that had given Nancy so much, that had given Jay so much, and that gave Jancy, we were that AA couple in Los Angeles, Jancy, Jay and Nancy, uh, that had given Jancy so much. And so I reframed my pain as small price to pay for a lifelong love affair. I took my wedding ring off and... Uh, took my ring and Nancy's to JR. He's a custom jeweler in Beverly Hills and said, melt the two rings together and make a thicker, wider one. And that's what I wear now. And so tonight you kind of have Jancy speaking two for the price of one. And, um, and I will tell you that those thunderbolt love feelings of that first night never dimmed, never abated, never lessened. And I would like to tell you that the behavior that we exhibited matched the feelings, but that would be a lie. 
because we were alcoholic. We were grandiose and arrogant and immature, self-pitying, self-righteous, defiant, defensive, scorekeeping, fear-based, reactive, um, and a whole lot of other characteristics that are really corrosive to relationships. And we were baffled. We could not figure out how we could love each other so deeply and not make it work. And it's like the brakes are out and we don't have an instruction manual to fix them and we don't know where to go to get them fixed. And, and we got sober. And, and you know, Dr. Paul, um, page 449 in the third edition, 417 in the fourth edition and acceptance, Dr. Paul and his wife, Max, Maxine, but he calls her Max, started this couples communication workshop for couples who had one, at least one person in a 12-step program. And we went the first time I had six months, Nancy had three months, it was an annual event. And we kind of re-pledged our love and we said, we're gonna try that, uh, what's that stuff called? Um, a monogamy, fidelity, because we had never, <laughs> We had never done that. We grew up in sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And if you're not with the one you love, love the one you're with. And, uh, you know, it was just, oh, my God. And uh, we were driving down the hill from Lake Arrowhead. And I said, I am going to find tools to make this work. And two days later, I discovered that the 12 traditions were the instruction manual for relationship. And not only that, but that there was a uh, connection between each step in the corresponding tradition, you know, and our problem was we were alcoholics, meaning we're, we're complete loners. Absolute. And that means I lie to you. I, my being a loner means I lie to you. I lie to me and I lie to God. And of those, the worst is that I lie to me because I say there is no problem. You got the problem. I don't have a problem. God, you don't exist. And even if you did, I got this. I don't need your help. And that was all a lie. And my life was unmanageable. And I had the allergy and the beast was upon me and outside everything looked good. You know, associate director of medical research at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles, beautiful wife, nice car, fancy business card, ready to die. And uh, just hopeless, trapped, desperate, lonely, baffled, confused, angry, terrified, simultaneously, filled with shame and guilt and, and self-hate. And, oh, my God, I just, my life was a wreck. And, and, and Nancy and I battled, and, the, and we couldn't figure it out. And the solution was right there in tradition one. Our common welfare comes first. The recovery of our marriage depends upon our unity. And I don't know, maybe it was my hair, but I thought it was my waist was a little smaller. My hair was a little bigger then. And uh, and I thought I was a mind reader. And I knew I didn't even think I knew that the IRS was after me and they had not sent a letter, which is what they do. They had not called. But I knew and they were going to seize the bank accounts and OK, rigorous honesty, the bank account singular. So I rushed to the bank. I pulled out the $9,800. That was all of our money. It was 1989. It wasn't insignificant. I put it in my back pocket. And the next day I went for a ride on my little motorcycle, my Honda shadow motorcycle, 750 CC. And I swear to God, I don't know how it happened, but I ended up in front of Glendale Harley Davidson and in the window was a used red soft tail with a price tag of $9,800. And I knew that meant the God in whom I did not believe wanted me to have a Harley. But Jancy wanted a house and we were saving that money for a down payment. But I wanted a Harley, but Jancy wanted a house. And for the first time, I made a conscious decision to put the common welfare first. And I left the Harley in the window and the money in my pocket. And I put it home on my little Honda shadow and put the money back in the bank and we added to it. And uh, a few years later, we bought a house and that's the house that, Nan that the home that we created. And that's where Nancy died and her ashes are buried and where I lived until last March when I moved to Mississippi. And, um, and Nancy and I developed this workshop on the traditions, and each one has a filter, and the filter for this tradition is, and, and let me pause before I give you the filter and say this works for relationships, not just romantic, 
but with family of origin and in the rooms and on the workplace and with God and on the freeway. It, this is, and if you just live, if you don't hear anything else, you don't like me, you don't like my pink tie and you want to leave, wait a minute, listen to this first tradition filter and then you can go. And I swear to God, it will that filter alone will change your life. And that is if you can pause and say, is what I'm about to say or what I'm about to do going to create greater separation or greater unity? Holy shit, your life will change. Your relationships will change. You know, and these traditions are designed to help transform deep loving feelings into consistent loving behavior. And that filter is what I'm about to say or what I'm about to do going to create greater separation or greater unity is amazing. And then you step into step two and step two talks about hope. We're insane. And, and it says that we can be restored to sanity and it gave me hope, but it didn't give me any tools. And that's the problem right there. That's the problem with step two and my insanity is old you know it's really old it's from trauma i my parents gave me away when i was three years old who i they probably thought they were good people they weren't they were monsters they locked me in a pitch black closet at three years old pulled me out once a day to wash me rape me and or torture me and that went on for years and i lost my sanity and safety and serenity and security and innocence and trust and and it, i it was unsafe and I was filled with rage and hate and I couldn't turn it on them. And I learned how to turn it on myself and spent decades hurting myself with my wounds. And um, that's what happens. And uh, then I got out and I was reunited with my parents and we moved to California and thank God I found drugs and alcohol, you know, and they were a solution They kept me from suiciding and let me stay on the planet, but made me stupid. And the stupidity led to bad decision making. And that decision making, in spite of being raised an atheist, that decision making put me in front of a power greater than myself, Judge William Ritzy. And on my first ever encounter with the criminal justice system, he sentenced me to double five to life's in the penitentiary. And man, I didn't want to go because Nancy, you know, I didn't have any fear at all because I didn't, I knew nothing about the criminal. I didn't know there was a difference between jail and prison. And it took me five hours to find the difference. I came up from Chow Hall that first night, came around a corner, five guys grabbed me, beat me almost to death and gang raped me. And that became my fare until I got out of the penitentiary. Because once that happens, that's who you are. And um, filled with so much bitterness and blame and rage and cowardice and irresponsibility and massive shame and PTSD. And, and you know, PTSD makes you just like hyper vigilant and you can't have your back to the door. You got to see what's happening. You got to control everything and everyone. And in my arrogance, I thought I knew what was best for me and best for you and best for Nancy and my landlord and my neighbor and the guy in front of me on the freeway. I knew I was the ultimate authority. And if you would just do it my way, I'd be OK, but you won't. And it makes me crazy. And that's my insanity. And this Step, step two gave me hope, but it didn't give me a single tool. And I step into tradition two, and there's the tool. Jay, there's one ultimate authority, and it's not you. It's a loving God. And maybe if you made a little bit of room, just a little bit, slide your butt over in that chair until your right cheek is hanging off. And then look down to the left and see that empty strip of chair and know that you've made room for God. And as God comes in, sanity comes right in with God. They hold hands. And that's how my sanity started to get back. Because I was like George Carlin. You know the comedian who says, isn't it funny when you're driving down the road, anybody driving slower than you is a goddamn idiot. And anybody driving faster is a freaking maniac. Like, I'm the only person who knows the right speed to drive on any given day, on any given road, in any given condition, because I am the ultimate authority. And if you would just listen to me, and you don't, and I'm crazy, and then God comes in. 
And then the tradition goes on to say there's one ultimate authority. It's a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. So Nancy and I went back to having threesomes, but this time it was Jay and Nancy and God. And here's what it looked like. I, we, based on the idea that you see what you look for, and I would look for a loving God in Nancy, and he already saw she was beautiful and kinder than she was beautiful. I look for a loving God in her, not hard to see. And when I saw it, it changed how I spoke to her and how I spoke about her and how I engaged her. And now comes the hard part because I hate me. But we see what we look for. And when I look for a loving God in me, I see it. And when I see it, it changes how I speak to myself and how I speak about myself. And most importantly, how I offer myself. And just from these first two traditions that behaviorally, that marriage changed 120 degrees, just from the first two traditions. And then there's step into step three that says that we made a decision to turn our will and our life over to the care of God. It's sort of long and the shorthand, I think, is I'm going to do God's work, not God's job. And let God do God's job, I'll do God's work. And so then I step into tradition three, which asks me, well, before I tell you what it asks me, I, I don't, I'm assuming looking at these faces, there are a lot of old timers here that I'm assuming you all know the history of AA, that in the beginning, people were so desperate to get sober and so protective of AA, they didn't want anyone in the rooms that wasn't a pure alcoholic. So they didn't want queers or crackpots or fallen women or prisoners or asylum inmates or beggars, tramps or thieves. I think the, the list is on page 140 in the 12 and 12. And they didn't want any of those people. They excluded them. And then Bill did the traditions. And in tradition three, AA became inclusive rather than exclusive. They stopped being conditional. And that's what I meant when I said I'm going to do God's work, not God's job. It's God's job to decide I'm going to keep you out. I'm going to let you in. I'm not going to do that. I, and I don't do it in my marriage, regardless of how Nancy's behaving on any given day. It's my job to show up and consistently be a husband who is honorable and honoring, passionate and compassionate, curious, consistent, courageous playful, spontaneous, forgiving, respectful, and a whole bunch of other qualities. Not like, I'll be nice, I'll be kind, I'll be loving if you do what I want you to do when I want you to do it in the bedroom, as long as we go to the restaurant I want to eat at or see the movie I want to. No, my job is to be unconditional in my love and in my behavior. It also means I let go of scorekeeping, remembering every good thing that I've ever done and every bad thing that Nancy ever did. And it means that I allow what Nancy brings to be enough because that makes it safe for her to risk bringing more, whether it's emotionally, sexually, financially, spiritually, on whatever level. When I allow what she brings to be enough, it makes it safe for her to risk giving more. And then I need to look and see what is my, am I being conditional in my relationship with God? God, I, 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 please, please, God, give me a miracle. And God did. Did he put Nancy's pancreatic stage four pancreatic cancer into remission? He did not. But he opened his, he opened the doors, he opened the gates, and he opened his arms and received Nancy when she died. And that was a miracle. You know, that's, I don't get to say, no, 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 the miracle has to look like this. You know, that story about the alcoholic falls overboard on the cruise ship and, uh, and he's, and thank God it's the middle of the day. And he goes, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. And the purser runs over and he grabs that bright orange life preserver and throws it and it lands right in front of the alcoholic who looks at it and looks up and says, don't you have a blue one? You know, that's being conditional. That's alcohol. That's being an alcoholic. No, no, I don't want that solution. Don't you have a, and then we step into step four and, um, and we take the courageous action 
of writing a fearless and searching, a fact-finding and fact-facing, fearless and searching, fact-finding and fact-facing inventory. And when I do, I learn, I become aware of, sensitized to, opened by and touch with, able to see that my behavior affects others. And only once I've seen that am I able to step into tradition four and to take responsibility when it's my job to take it and to be autonomous, self-governing, except in matters affecting Nancy or the couple as a whole. So sometimes I need to be autonomous, but if it affects her or the couple as a whole, then I don't get to be autonomous. So we lived in West Hollywood. We went to a Monday night meeting in Beverly Hills. We had a big, wide, white Chevy Blazer. And when I drove, I drove the right way, south on Martell and west on 6th. And Nancy would go, what are you doing? We're going to get sideswiped on these little side streets. And when Nancy drove, she drove the wrong way, west on Santa Monica, south on La Cienega, and all this traffic. And we'd fight all the way to the meeting. And then we said, holy, wait, fourth tradition. Driver should be autonomous because whether we go south and west or west and south, we're going to get to the meeting. And people started noticing, you guys look so happy. What's different? We said, we're driving by the fourth tradition. And I think that's a pretty cute story. And here's one that's not. I carry a million dollars of life insurance on me always and a half million on Nancy. And, uh, I guess we crossed some age threshold and the premium jumped and that annual premium came and it was like, holy shit, that's a lot, that's a lot of money. And, um, and I looked at Nancy and she was slim and svelte and doing her martial arts. And I looked at me and I was about 50 pounds heavier and, and uh, I'm a hospice nurse and living a sedentary lifestyle. And I said, I'm the one who's going to have the stroke or heart attack and die. And without saying a word to her, I didn't pay the premium on her policy. And 30 days later, they canceled it for non-payment. And 20 days after that, Nancy was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer and given four months to live. And as she made that journey, she said, this is so hard. I'm losing not just you, honey, but everyone and everything that I love. But I got to tell you, I'm so comforted knowing that there's going to be that half million dollar cushion to carry you through retirement. And I couldn't lie to her. I mean, she would have known and I don't lie to her. And I told her and she was so pissed. And she said, why would you do that without talking to me? You've got, we've got a fourth tradition that says you don't self-govern. You don't make those decisions if they affect me or us. And I didn't have an answer other than, well, I've, I forgot and um, I'm, I'm stingy and uh, I was assumptive and disrespectful and uh, and I said, I'm sorry. And we cried in each other's arms and she forgave me. And so what, you know, here's the deal. If I take a nice China dinner plate and I throw it on the ground and it breaks and I go, oh, my God, I'm so sorry, plate. It's still broken. And Nancy still had that added burden right up into her death, worrying about my financial state in, uh, in retirement. And I live with the burden of knowing that I added to Nancy's burden on what was already a difficult journey for us, for her and for us. So that's a good lesson on that fourth tradition. And, and then in, in, um, I, need to speed this up. So I'm going to maybe skip some of the steps and just say in the fifth tradition, we talk about that we our primary purpose is to carry the message. Well, what's the message? The message is love and tolerance. That's the code we live by, love and tolerance. And we carry it to the alcoholic who suffers. It doesn't say the drunk, homeless alcoholic living in the bushes outside the meeting hall, outside Log Cabin in West Hollywood. It just says the alcoholic. So Nancy comes home and, and she's an interior plantscaper. She's been do, going to accounts all day, taking care of the plants in people's houses and businesses and fighting LA traffic. And she comes in and she's tired and frustrated and her arms are full and 
she can't close the door. And so she kicks it shut and it slams. And I'm like, hey, what are you bringing that anger into my house for? Don't you know I've got PTSD? But it's not mine. It's ours. And it's not a house. It's a home. And what if instead of looking at, at, at that behavior of hers as anger, what if I look at it as suffering? She's had a really hard day and she's suffering. Uh, instantly, I'm told by this tradition that I need to bring love and tolerance to her. And it's not hard because it's Nancy. And now without excusing myself from accountability or responsibility, I have to accept the fact that sometimes my usually dormant PTSD gets triggered. And when it does, it can come out in some wonky behavior. And instead of sitting there going, you asshole, you loser, you piece of sh I need to realize that I'm suffering and bring love and tolerance to me to let go of judgment and replace it with mercy because they're exact opposites. Judgment comes from the head and mercy comes from the heart and judgment wounds and mercy heals and judgment separates and mercy unites. And judgment is just touching pain with fear and mercy is touching that same pain with love. And then I step into tradition six and I'm a hospice nurse and a grief recovery counselor. I work with the dying and the grieving, and, and I'm not about money and property, but I got to watch out for the prestige piece, you know, the prestige of being the one in the know when I gossip. Oh, my God, did you hear that Susie and Joe broke up? Now, see how important I am because I knew that and you didn't? Or being the martyr when I work harder on a sponsees recovery than they do uh -uh. or the prestige of being the guy who had the roughest the most violent horrible childhood no i didn't i had a really bad childhood and so did lots of people right in this room you know but i also got some gifts from that horrendous childhood i suffered and I suffered enough to have to cultivate a relationship with suffering. And that suffering became my vehicle for awakening compassion in me and for me and for others. And as an award-winning hospice nurse and educator in end-of-life care, my ability to be with suffering, physical suffering, emotional suffering, spiritual suffering, to be there with the compassionate presence and bear witness without the desperate need to impose my tools unless and until they're requested, all came out of that childhood suffering. I've got post-traumatic stress disorder, but I've got post-traumatic growth as well. And that is the source that is the source of my tremendous compassion, that suffering. So then I step into the life-saving seventh tradition. And I know a lot of you think, oh, seventh tradition, that's when they pass the basket. I talk to my neighbor while they read the traditions. I don't pay attention. It's just about the money. And it's about the money, but it's so much more. So I'm not a very good shot with a rifle. I don't know why. I'm incredibly skilled with a pistol. And I haven't ever been formally trained, but I'm marksman level. And I want to tell you, before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I shot myself in the foot so many times. My health, my, my relationship, my finances, my career. I mean, holy crap, self-sabotaging again and again and again. And the filter that we created for the seventh tradition just says is what I'm about to say or what I'm about to do self-sabotaging or self-supporting? And if it's self-sabotaging, I don't do it, period. And that filter saved my life in early sobriety when again and again, I was poised to do something that would have been so self-sabotaging. Saved my life. And then we step into step eight and we do that little three column inventory. Who did I harm? How did I harm them? What were the character defects at play? Very simple inventory. And in writing that inventory, I become sensitized 
to the harm that I caused. And then I step into tradition eight. That's the one that says that we ought remain forever non-professional. What does that have to do with harm and with marriage? And the answer is everything. So we're at that Monday night meeting in Beverly Hills and the meeting ends and Nancy's talking to this really nice couple and I'm not a part of the conversation, but I'm close enough to overhear it. And we're not going out to eat with them or at least not that night or anything. And I hear Nancy say, oh my God, our favorite Italian restaurant's Benvenuto at La Cienega in Santa Monica. And I go, no, it isn't. It's on the south side of Santa Monica, just west of La Cienega. And I saw the hurt in Nancy's eyes. I saw how I had harmed her by speaking to her so harshly, let alone speaking to her harshly in front of other people. And then having this desperate need to be right, that I was willing to make her wrong. And I vowed, man, I will never do that again. I will, because I saw the harm that I had done. And what was going on was I was acting like the professional, because what is a professional? An expert, a know-it-all who's focused on the win and being right and being rigid and intolerant and impatient competitive. I want to be the amateur in my marriage and as a husband who does it for fun and for free, who's cooperative, not competitive, who's curious, not the know-it-all, who's flexible, not rigid. Holy shit, what a different way to behave in relationship. Like the amateur, patient, tolerant. If Nancy falls down, it's fine, honey. We're, we're focused on the journey, not the, not the win. There's no getting behind. I just help her get up or she waits while I get up and we continue on the journey. And that's what it is. It's, there is no win. There's no end point. And then in a similar way, tradition nine talks about AA ought never be organized. And that's the one where I sacrifice being manipulative because when I hear the word manipulative, I think organized, right? Organized. I'm trying to organize your thoughts, your words, and your behavior to further my agenda or endorse my position. That's what manipulation is. I'm trying to organize your thoughts, your words, and your behavior to further my agenda or endorse my position. And anything I get, through manipulation, whether it's in the bedroom, the boardroom, <laughs> the, the AA meeting hall, anything I get through manipulation is going to be less satisfying and it's going to just feel kind of dirty and, and sneaky and unsatisfying. And when I'm busy manipulating, there's no room for curiosity, there's no room for humility, and there's certainly no room for God or trusting that God has a plan and that it will be fine. I don't need to do anything. I just need to show up and be of service. And then I step into step 10 and, um, and I write daily inventory. And I'm either going to write inventory or I'm going to create it. I'm either going to take my inventory or I'm going to take yours. And when I do that, then I'm able to step into tradition 10 that talks about AA I have no opinion on outside issues. And to understand that, I've got to figure out what the inside issues are. And for me, there are three, my relationship with AA or recovery, my relationship with God, my relationship with Nancy. Those are the three inside issues and any and everything else is an outside issue. I might have an opinion on it, but it's not a hill I'm going to die on. It's just intellectual. Well, I think that... Um, I remember when Al Gore did the came up with the idea of of corn uh, for biofuel, and I jumped on that bandwagon. It's good for the environment. It's good for the farmer. It makes us energy independent. The price of uh, fuel comes down. It's it's a win 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 five wins. I said, "Don't you think so, Nancy?" And she said, "I don't know. Let me think about it." She came back and because she went off and then came back. That's how she, I think on my feet, she doesn't. 
And she said, you know, I don't know what's wrong with it, but it just doesn't, it doesn't sit right with me. Fast forward three years, so many U.S. wheat farmers have started growing corn that the price of wheat goes up because there's less of it, and children are starving in third world countries that depend on buying cheap U.S. wheat. Not Al Gore's intention, but, but Nancy knew, and, and it wasn't something we were willing to fight about because it was an outside issue. And I always think of that married couple. They're both political commentators, Mary Matlin and James Carville. One is a staunch liberal. One is a staunch conservative. They always appear together on TV shows. And never once have I seen them be disrespectful to one another or disagreeable with one another. And yet they disagree intellectually on almost every political point. And so this tradition teaches me how to disagree without being disagreeable. And I want to tell you, in a marriage, that's a real, real valuable skill, without a doubt. And, um, and then I step into my favorite tradition, Tradition 11, that talks about our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotional personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. And, and you're saying, well, what does that have to do with a marriage? Oh, my God. So I'll tell you, here's what it has to do with it. And um, I was raised atheist, you know, drilled into my head. There is no God. There is no God. Don't ever believe in God. It's the opiate of the masses. It makes you weak. It's used to control people drilled into my head. And then I had the incest to prove there was no God and the gang rapes and the gang beatings in, in the penitentiary. And that proved there was no God. And besides that, I'm a scientist. I was pre-vet. My bachelor's degree is biology and biochemistry. I've had every ology there is. I've had physiology and embryology and histology and immunology. And I'm a scientist. That's what I told myself, eight semesters of chemistry, four semesters of physics, calculus, and all those ologies, and I was not a scientist. I just had a lot of science classes. But a scientist, by definition, is open-minded and curious and investigative, and I wasn't. I was just intellectually lazy and parroting what my parents told me. There is no God. There is no God. That being said, because I did not believe in God, but I blamed the God in whom I did not believe for every bad thing that ever happened to me and credited that God with absolutely none of the good. And in spite of being an atheist, I prayed to that God all the time. And here's what the prayer sounded like with punctuation, please, comma, God, comma, don't let that liquor store close before I get there. Please, comma, God, comma, don't let those police be pulling me over. Please, comma, God, comma, let the dope dealer be there and the dope be good. You know, that, that was my prayers. So Nancy and I never had children because we don't like children. No offense to those of you that like them. Um, well, I mean, we had fur children, dogs, but no human children. And thank God, you know, there are people out there that don't like children and they go ahead and have them anyway. Oh my God, that's crazy. So we didn't like them, didn't have them. Here's alcoholism. I'm working as associate director of medical research at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. I don't like children. Where am I working? At a children's hospital. Why? Because I'm such a piece of shit. I can't even look you in the eye and I can't impress you, but I got a business card that says Associate Director of Medical Research. And I think that I, the fantasy was that will impress you and stayed in a job that I did not like serving a population that I didn't like on the chance that the fantasy was right, that that card would impress you. And I got sober Friday, December 2nd. They said, you should go to Log Cabin. You're really sick. You would benefit from morning meetings. Go to Log Cabin, AA, 7.30 a.m., Robertson Boulevard, West Hollywood. And I did, Monday morning, day three of sobriety. And I started to walk up the steps. And you know how we can spot the newcomers? This guy took one look at me and he said, hi, honey. 
Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, if you leave your fantasies at the door, all of your dreams can come true in AA if you're willing to work for them. And I about fell over because I didn't know there was a difference between fantasies and dreams. And I had a fantasy I was living. I, I'll stay on this job I hate because I got a business card that will impress you. And I was ignoring my dreams, which was to work with the dying. And with three days sober, that meeting ended at 8.30 a.m. And I drove into the hospital and quit my job. And I went downtown to LA County USC Medical Center, County General Hospital, largest hospital in the United States at that point in time. And I got a job as a cancer nurse. And I did it for a year and I got recruited to the pain management service and I did that for a year. And then I made the leap to hospice 32 years ago. And, um, and here's what happened. The place where life and death meet is filled with God, period, period. It's not a thought, it's not a theory, it's not a hypothesis, it's not a consideration. For me, it is an experiential certainty. And it happened again and again and again. And I'm going on death call after death call after death. And every time God is right there. And the room is filled with God. And I couldn't deny it. And I, 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 I just didn't even, I was speechless. Me, speechless. Could you imagine? <laughs> And um, all I had to do then was figure out how my story and that God that I couldn't deny worked because my story is pretty rugged. And where I got to was there is a loving God that designed it, created it, put it in motion, and gave us free will. And that God never leaves my side, co-journeys with me always, and co-suffers with me. Watched me being raped at three and four and five and six years old and wept at my suffering and looked at my rapists and wept at their suffering that they had moved so far from his grace but did not intervene because he made them with everything they needed for redemption and made me with everything I needed for resilience. And I don't know if they reached for it. But I know that I did first through drugs and alcohol. And when that didn't work, then through the powerful fellowship and the transformative steps and traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I found my resilience in these rooms and it made me whole, W-H-O-L-E, whole. Sexually, emotionally, spiritually, physically, I am whole, meaning nothing missing, nothing broken. That's what whole means, nothing missing, nothing broken. And what's so interesting is that now I have this deep, intimate, personal relationship with a loving God, and yet my prayer has not changed from when I was an atheist, except for the punctuation, where it used to be, please, comma, God, comma, don't let that liquor store close. Now my prayer is, please, God. Speak and behave in a way that I believe would please a loving God. And that became the filter in our traditions workshop for tradition 11. As my loving God stands next to me, would that God find what I'm about to say or what I'm about to do attractive? And if I don't believe a loving God would find my words and my behavior attractive, then I don't say them and I don't do them. And I want to tell you, I'm really good. Not perfect, but I'm really good at these 11 traditions. They're absolutely amazing. They changed my marriage. I'm, only, I'm going to be 35 years sober in, um, in just under two months. And I suck at tradition 12. I'm hoping by the time I get to 40 years sober, I will be able to do that 12th tradition, which calls me to sacrifice my desperate need for acknowledgement, credit, applause, sex, presence, a band, confetti. You know, I just, look, Nancy, I vacuumed. She goes, I know, honey, I saw, and I saw the six little spots that you missed. <laughs> you know, Nancy, I took the garbage out. 
well, wouldn't you do that if you lived alone? I picked up the dog poop, you know, that desperate need for an attaboy. Good job, Jay. And um, I was running around the country lecturing at a lot of hospice conferences and um, as keynote speaker for these conferences. And they gave me nice size checks and paid my airfare and my... And I quietly put those checks into paying the mortgage down. And we paid off a 30-year mortgage in 14 years. And I wrote that final check. And I walked into Nancy's home office and she was on her computer. And I said, Nancy, I just wrote the last check. I paid off the mortgage. The house is ours. And she looked up at me and said, oh, my God, honey, that's amazing. I love you. And went back to work. And I about fell over. I said, what? What? Where? Where's the band? Where's the confetti, the parade, the sex, the presence? I mean, I bet. Forgetting she's from Wichita, Kansas. And she stopped typing and looked up at me with those Midwestern work, work and money vows and said, she said, sweetheart, they lent us the money and we paid it back. That's what we're supposed to do. So I hate the 12th tradition. I suck at it. Maybe in five years, I'll have gotten a little bit better. But I want to tell you, these 12 traditions are amazing in how giving me the tools to transform deep loving feelings into consistent loving behavior. I hope you all got at least something out of one of these traditions. My name's Jay Westbrook. I'm an alcoholic. Thanks. <laughs>